What do you do when your cool classic truck has a tired, worn out Windsor? You tear it down for some big power adders. Plus, from concept to canvas, how to visualize your dream truck. That and more, right now on Truck Tech. You've seen us build a lot of different projects here on the show. Often we're building more than one at the same time. The bad thing is it can be very easy to lose motivation when we're halfway through a project. Yeah, you can get overwhelmed with it, or I mean, you can even get flat out bored. But today we're going to show you something that I promise you will give you a little inspiration. This is concept designer Daniel Maffitt, owner of Maffitt Motorworks. Hey man, how's it going? Good, Good to see man. you again. How are you? He can take your ride and with a few swipes of a pen, create your dream car on canvas. I was 12 years old and overhauling first came out on TV and I was just blown away with what Chip Foose could do. And I knew right then and there I, I wanted to start drawing cars and learning that skill. Whether it's an idea you have for an interior, engine bay, custom body mods, or just an overall build, his drawings help clients visualize their project. And he's not just an artiste. Maffet is also a custom builder, painter, and photographer. When people come to you for like a design consultation or to have to do a rendering, like where do people typically start? Do they have like a finished product in mind or do they just say, hey man, I, I've got this idea, you know, I want to work around a, a particular style or, or a theme. Like how does that work? A lot of times when someone comes to me, they usually have an inspiration or an idea or some kind of a loose concept of what they're looking for. And they bring all those elements to me and then I work to kind of put them into a cohesive design, something that they can be happy with for a finished product they can tour and show. So someone might come into something and think they know exactly what they want. And then once the design process starts happening and they can see it visually, their, their likes and dislikes can change. I have an example of that okay. here. So with this customer, he thought he wanted a full Fender 32. Okay. Then we started drawing it and showing him different options he could have. His style kind of changed from that. So we ended up doing a couple different renderings. Um, so we did a standard hard top. We did a roadster. Okay. And we did uh, an open fendered hard top, and then we did a complete slammed hot rod style. Okay. And he, he wasn't sure what direction he was gonna go in, but once he saw all these, he ended up going complete opposite of a full fendered car with a roof, and he ended up doing the Roadster with a... Yeah, that, I mean, that's two totally different, you know, end results, but without, without seeing it, I mean, you really can't make that decision because something you have in your mind, I guess it just totally changes, huh? It does, and, and this, this process saves you a lot of money in the long run, because if you build a car with all fenders and you get it all done, you decide and you're done. I don't really like it. You can't just you have to start all over again. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's another hundred thousand dollar build. Where this, you can see it visually and make your decisions on paper. Yeah, paper's cheap, right? Yeah, you can erase it. <laughs> well, we've got our truck over here in the shop. Uh, why don't we take a look at it and yeah. get started? Yeah, I'm excited. Well, here she is. It's a '74 F100. You know, we've done a few things to it, but it's really just a blank canvas, so we can do kind of whatever we want with it. Yeah, it looks like a solid truck. It's a good truck to start with for sure. You know, there's a whole lot of different things we could do to this truck. You know, we threw around the ideas of maybe doing like a factory style two-tone, you know, just not having to paint it, but maybe just put some accent colors on it. Yeah, this truck, you know, they, this year they had some really great lines. So those two tones will look really good if you decide to go that way. I really need to know what your goal is with the truck. What's what's the final outcome? What are you going to do with it? Okay, well, yeah, we're going for like a pro touring style truck. You know, low to the ground, wide sticky tires, something that'll handle really good, have a good aggressive, you know, good looking stance. Maybe not change so much on the outside, but just low mean. These trucks always look good laid out. Just as low as you can get them, as long as they'll perform right. Yeah, just perfectly flat? Just perfectly flat. Okay. So you guys are going to do some vintage flare wheels or you can do all modern style wheels? Yeah, I think we really want to keep it in a, a 70s style. Maybe not modernize it too much because, like I said, we're not going to change a lot on the outside of the truck. So maybe a wheel that has like a, a salt flat style or maybe like a vintage spoke looking wheel, but, you know, in a modern pro touring size, you know, maybe an 18 or a 19. Yeah, that's going to look, maybe even stagger them a little bit too. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've got enough to uh, get going, so I'll get to work. Well, I'm excited to see what you come up with. Awesome. As you can see, I'm starting with a, a line drawing. I work uh, hand-drawn sketches until they're a, a nice, crisp line drawing. And then I take that line drawing and I can transfer it onto 
a couple sheets of different paper so I can do some quick different color changes without redrawing line drawing from scratch every time. Next, the guys ponder their choices. Hey, welcome back to Truck Tech. We're over here in our Power Nation studios where concept designer Daniel Maffitt is working on a few renderings for our F100. I believe he's got one finished up. There you go, man. Man, that looks killer. Yeah, a little uh, Ford Victory Blue. Yeah, that looks awesome, man. I really love the stance, how low it sits to the ground, and the wheels. I dig those because that really fits the style of build we're going for. And the blue, man, I love it because blue is one of my favorite colors. But since that truck is so nice and it's already red, is there any way we could tie that in anywhere? Yeah, we can do, uh, I'll do a, a factory style two-tone, maybe a real aggressive two-tone to kind of match that pro touring feel. Man, yeah, that'd be really cool. Well, I'm excited to see what you come up with. All right, man, I'll get cool, to man. it. Now, we did consult on the wheels before I drew them. I had a talk with Jeremy and LT, and they kind of had an idea of the style of wheel they wanted, but they left it up to me to decide what I ended up putting on paper. So I went with a, uh, a vintage salt flat kind of style. You guys are spoiling me here. I usually don't have the truck available when I'm drawing something. I usually have to work off photos. Having it in real space here is actually really nice. Chip Foose actually introduced me to these markers and he gave me a, a small set and said these were the ones that I needed to be drawing with. There's a lot of tools you can use to render a car uh, professionally, but these are ad markers. These are al alcohol-based markers and they just, they blend really well, they flow nicely on the paper, and they give you real nice, crisp colors. Doing a rendering, a concept rendering of a piece, a part, or a vehicle is one image, and it's a style, and it's got my flair on it. It might not be theirs, but we meet in the middle. Daniel's all done with our renderings, and we've thrown them up on our video wall so we can take a good look. We have lots of great options to choose from so we can move forward inspired with our F100 build. Well, man, you've definitely given us a variety to choose from, and I'm really digging the two red ones, especially the cream. That's really clean. I just don't think we can go wrong with any of them. I mean, the, the F100 would look great in any of those color combinations. Yeah, it wouldn't. There's just variety of workload. You know, the blue is going to be a full repaint. The red one with the black trim is going to be, you know, a little bit of two-tone paint and black gloss trim. The cream one is just going to be a nice factory-style two-tone. Well, like I said, they all look good. And if you guys need any design or rendering services, be sure to check out Maffet Motorworks. Daniel, thank you so much for coming in. Thanks, you know, man. We really appreciate it. Man, hey, man, I've got a side project. Maybe oh, yeah? you need what to you talk got? about 67 C10. Yeah, Get a crazy full-blown build. Put a diesel Body on. drop. No diesel. No diesel. <laughs> Quit talking about diesel. <laughs> Now you guys can see why we love doing renderings. This gives us a good foundation to see where we're headed. Especially a guy like me who's a painter, I can pitch some of these ideas like these two tones to my rendering guy. He can lay them out on paper and that gives me a good idea of what I need to do when I start working on the truck. We're not quite ready to get this involved in our F100 project. We still have a little bit of budget left and some work left to do on our first round of upgrades. Looks really cool. Up next, our F-100 moves across the shop to begin its top-end transformation. One of my favorite things to do is change up the power plant underneath the hood of a truck or a car. Recently, we put this F-100 on the chassis dyno where it put down an embarrassing 146 horsepower. That's just awful. So today, we're going to spice things up a little bit in the engine department. Before you Ford guys change the channel, don't worry, we're not going to be putting in an LS this time. We are going to be building on this 351 because it's a pretty good platform to start with. It just needs a little or a lot of help in the induction department. So today we're going to tear down the engine so we can install a new set of heads, a different cam and intake. And as always, work begins by tearing it down. Working on an old school engine like this Windsor is a nice change, kind of brings it back to basics. We won't be needing any special tools, a laptop for tuning, or things like larger injectors or a wideband O2 sensor. Engines are essentially massive air pumps, and the more air it can suck in, the more power it will make. Vehicles built in the 70s often have extremely low power per cubic inch due to the tightening emission regulations of the time. By changing out our smog air heads with a modern high-flowing set, we can expect a huge jump in power. 
teardown continues with the alternator coming off. Then the upper radiator and heater hoses. With some masking tape and a marker, I'll label the pertinent wires going to different sensors. The distributor comes out next and the hole is plugged to keep any dirt or hardware from falling in. Up top, the fuel line is disconnected, Ouch. along with the throttle linkage. And the old carb goes away. The valve cover bolts get removed, and with a little persuasion, the old gaskets let go. The intake manifold bolts all have to come out and a pry bar easily breaks the seal, and the intake manifold comes off. This nifty tray from Goodson helps to keep track of the valve train. All 16 rockers and push rods are removed. Again, a shop rag is used to keep dirt and debris out of the engine. The exhaust manifolds are next on the chopping block. Then, the head bolts are removed in the reverse order of tightening to evenly unload the clamping force on the head. With both sides removed, we're down to a bare short block. It's always a little bit nerve-wracking taking apart an older or higher mileage engine. It's just like that famous shrimp boat captain says, you never really know what you're gonna get. Our short block is in pretty decent shape, but there is a small ridge at the top of each of the cylinder walls. Basically what that means is our engine is a little bit worn and it has some miles on it. But the good thing is this engine didn't smoke and it didn't burn any oil. So it'll be a good candidate for a mild build. Now, if we wanted to pump this thing up to be five or 600 horsepower, then yeah, we should probably pull the engine out, machine it to accept an oversized piston and clean up those cylinder walls. But again, this is just a mild build for us. Plus it saves us a little bit on our budget. You might be wondering why we didn't just yank this whole engine out and attach it to a stand. Well, to do the type of work that we're doing, a heads and a cam swap, well, it really wouldn't save us that much more time. But it wouldn't take that much more time either. So it's just preference. We decided it's just easier to leave it in there and save us the hassle. Now, coming up, we do need to get that cam out, and we'll do that after the break. We are well on our way tearing down this 351 Windsor in our quest for more horsepower. The next thing to come out is the camshaft, and to make that happen, we need to make some room up front. Because of the length of the cam, we need to move a lot of things out of the way up front so it has room to slide out. So the fan shroud and radiator have to go. It has trans cooler lines connected to it, as well as the lower radiator hose. Once the mounting bolts are removed, it can be lifted out of the way. I'll disconnect the AC lines, and we'll also need to remove the condenser. Back on the engine, I'll undo the bolts and remove the water pump. Next, the four lower crank bolts come out, and the pulley gets gently tapped off. To remove the balancer, a special puller is required as to not damage anything. Don't use a three-jaw puller on the outside ring because you'll wreck the balancer. A series of bolts up front and some on the oil pan hold the front timing cover to the block. The fuel pump gets disconnected and the timing cover can come off. The cam sprocket bolt comes out and the upper gear and chain are removed. Up in the valley, all 16 lifters come out. We'll rotate the cam until each lifter pops up, then we can pull them out. Finally, the cam can be removed from the block, completing teardown. We need to clean up the deck surface to prepare it for the new heads, so we'll start with a metal scraper to remove all the leftover gasket chunks and rust. Then we'll soak it in WD-40 and use a rigid sanding block and 180 grit paper. We'll wipe it down with brake cleaner and make a final pass with more WD-40 and 220 grit this time. When it comes to cleaning up a block, I see guys often reach for this, a red Scotch-Brite on an angle grinder. Now there's no question it'll make quick work of the job, but the trouble is these are actually very aggressive and they'll take away a lot of material. Often it'll be uneven, which can lead to head gasket sealing issues. Now, this is one of those instances where quicker isn't always better. So that's why I like to do it by hand.
The basic principles of an internal combustion engine are mixing air and fuel and burning it to create power. Now, through the years, there have been many different changes in how that air and fuel are mixed and delivered, but the principles are all the same. Control how much air enters the engine and mix the right amount of fuel with that air. Now, since the invention of the engine until roughly the mid-1980s, just about every vehicle on the road used a carburetor. Fuel gets pumped up from the tank and it's stored into these little reservoirs or a fuel bowl. And it's delivered into the engine with these small tubes using the Venturi effect. Basically, the faster the air moves by it, the more fuel gets sucked along with it. Engine speed is controlled by how much air is allowed in. So as you press the accelerator, these plates or throttle blades open up. After that, the air and fuel mixture is distributed to all cylinders by the intake manifold. Starting in the mid-80s, TBI or throttle body injection got its 15 minutes of fame, and it was one of the first versions of fuel injection. Now, it kind of went away from mainstream use, but it's come back in recent years due to the rise in popularity of self-learning EFI systems like this one. Now, these do look similar to a carburetor, but they work much differently. Pressurized fuel enters from the pump, gets regulated, and excess is returned to the tank. The pressurized fuel then sits in this cavity surrounding the injectors. When the computer sends a pulse to the injector, fuel sprays down onto the throttle blades. Just like in the carburetor, when the throttle is opened, more air goes into the engine and RPMs increase. Multi-port fuel injection has been around since the early 90s on most American cars, and in many cases, it's actually still used today. Now, the manifolds look much different from a TBI or a carbureted setup. The biggest difference is there's no fuel that actually passes by the throttle plate. Its only job is to control how much air goes into the engine. Now, it's called multi-port. What that means is there's an injector in each intake port. And you can see the tip of the injector sits right in the path. And basically, it will spray fuel almost right through the intake valve into the engine. Now, pressurized fuel comes from the pump and enters this rail, which is common to all eight injectors. It'll sit here under pressure from about 40 to 60 PSI until the computer pulses the injector, letting fuel into the engine. Each of these systems has its pros and cons, and the debate of which one is best will never be solved. But if you want an efficient daily driver, then you might choose a multi-port setup. And many guys argue that for all-out power and performance, you can't beat a carb. And if you want to modernize an old-school engine, then a TBI conversion might be the way to go. A smart upgrade to any cooling system is switching to Evans Waterless Coolant. It has a boiling point of 375 degrees, which is well above the operating temp of an engine. It won't vaporize around engine hot spots, and it'll pull more heat out of your engine and won't pressurize your cooling system. But on top of that, it also eliminates corrosion, so your engine will run cooler in the most extreme conditions. For more, check out EvansCoolant.com. If you have a classic pickup with a fresh coat of paint, nothing looks worse than topping it off with some old faded lights or busted trim. LMC Truck can help you out. They have replacement parts for Ford and Dodge, as well as these, which fit a Chevy. You can get stock replacements in satin silver or step it up to chrome. Plus, they have a complete line of replacement lighting. Visit LMCTruck.com to pick up your free catalog. All right, we've got the engine torn down in our F100 and prepped, ready for a few new parts. So we decided to go with a set of Edelbrock Performer RPM heads, an air gap intake, a new cam, lifters, and a timing gear set. And we picked all this up from Summit Racing. Now these parts combined will put us in the ballpark of around 400 horses. And I'd say that's pretty good considering where we started. But I'll tell you a little bit more about these parts next time when we install them. Now you'll remember that we're actually calling this a budget build. So far on the suspension and rear axle, we spent 2,400 bucks. So the rest of our money is gonna go into the engine so we can make this truck a little bit quicker around that road course. You know, a $7,500 budget on a build like this, that's not too bad. Works out pretty good. Yeah. So for more information on our F100 or any other projects, be sure to check out PowerNationTV.com. Hey, thanks for watching Truck Tech. We'll see you next time. So we doing this like red or Ford blue? I'll see you, Sam. You like that? That's a rare thing. It's a good skill to have, isn't it? I don't know where else I'd use it, but...